So after the Constitution is written and the delegates at the Constitutional Convention actually send it out to the states to be ratified, there's a process that has to be followed. And so that's what this lesson is about, enacting the Constitution. So they have to go through the ratification process. It's submitted to the states in September 1787. This was in your previous presentation from the Constitutional Convention. And there's a Federalist and an Anti-Federalist argument. The Federalist argument in support of the Constitution is really pushed by a series of newspaper editorials written by James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, and John Jay. It's all collected in a book today called The Federalist Papers, but really then it was just a series of editorials published in newspapers. It defends the Constitution as a representative government that protects the personal liberties of all citizens. So they really are writing it to try to calm the fears of people who are falling under the category of being an anti-federalist. They really want people to trust that the Constitution is not going to violate their rights. Here is the cover of the Federalist Papers and the three authors' images and names. So it's famous today as a book, but it's really just editorials in 1787 and 1788. The anti-federalists, on the other hand, such as Patrick Henry from Virginia, Samuel Adams from Massachusetts, were the leading figures of the anti-federalist movement. They feared the central government would become way too powerful and trample the rights of the people. In order to support the Constitution, men like Henry and Adams forced the Federalists to agree to publish the Bill of Rights after the document had been ratified. So immediately upon ratification of the Constitution, they would need to discuss the Bill of Rights. We're going to learn a lot about the Bill of Rights in future presentations. This is Patrick Henry, painting of him, and his most famous quote, Give me liberty or give me death. And then Samuel Adams, this is a famous painting of him. He's a cousin to John Adams, who ends up the second president of the United States. There's a famous quote of his and one of my favorites. It does not take a majority to prevail, but rather an irate, tireless minority, keen on setting brush fires of freedom in the minds of men. So you saw in your Constitutional Convention presentation that at least nine of the 13 states needed to ratify the Constitution in order for it to become law. And the first state, um, Delaware's nickname is the first state, it was on December 7th of 1787. New Hampshire was the ninth state, and therefore the Constitution was the new government on June 21st, 1788. New York, our state, on July 26th, 1788. And Rhode Island was the last state to ratify on May 29th of 1790. So we already discussed the ratification process, just a quick review. Again, repeating, but please write everything down again anyway. It's proven that if you write things down, especially more than once, you tend to remember them. So please write these down, even though this is very repetitious. The separation of powers and checks and balances. Two terms that are often confused as meaning the same thing. They are not the same thing. Separation of powers means actually physically dividing up the various responsibilities of government among the three branches. So this pie graph looking chart, when you physically separate out the legislative, executive, and judicial branches, that is separation of powers. Checks and balances, on the other hand, each branch can overrule another that has abused its power in some way. If the President of the United States does something that is illegal, they can be impeached by the House of Representatives and the legislative branch. An action that they have taken can be declared unconstitutional by the judicial branch. Again, if the President of the United States vetoes a law, that veto can be overridden by Congress. And if his action is considered unconstitutional by the judiciary, that is yet another check on the President's power. So the physical division is separation of powers. The careful consideration of who gets what power is checks and balances. Some of the best examples of checks and balances, a president can veto a bill passed by Congress, but Congress can override that presidential veto with a two-thirds majority vote. 
and the Supreme Court can declare an act of Congress or the President unconstitutional. These are the three most common examples of checks and balances. There are other examples. The President can nominate a Supreme Court justice, but the Senate could reject the appointment and not approve of it. The President can sign a treaty with another nation, and then a Senate can reject that treaty and not approve of it. Congress can disapprove of a war and cut off of its funding. Congress appropriates funds for something, but the President could delay sending the money and enforcing the rules associated with that money. Congress can appropriate funds for something, and the Supreme Court can declare it unconstitutional. So these are all examples of checks and balances, these first three here being the most common. And federalism. Federalism is the relationship between the state governments and the federal government. Really kind of like the balance of power between the state and federal governments. Who has what power? In Article 6, Section 2 of the Constitution, it states that the federal government shall be considered supreme in any situation where state law conflicts with federal law. Do not confuse, please, the term federalism and the term federal supremacy, because they are very, very different terms. Federalism, like I said, is kind of like the balance of power between the state and federal governments. Federal supremacy is if state and federal governments conflict with each other on a certain issue and there is no statute from the Constitution that specifies who has that power, then it is assumed that the federal government has that power due to federal supremacy. In the early republic, there are Supreme Court cases that support the concept of federal supremacy. We will learn about those in greater detail in a future presentation. That's all for this presentation. Please make sure that you log into the website and take the online quiz. You may use your notes, so that really shouldn't be an issue of getting a good score on your homework quiz. Thank you.